Okay, so in the previous lecture, we talked about finite state machine concept. So we were taking a look at how are we going to go from a problem statement to perhaps a state diagram. And we also looked at how to go back. So given a finite state machine, how do you do a reverse engineering? Meaning, how do you go from a circuit to a state diagram? So we, we looked at both those cases in the previous uh, lecture. Now we are going to be focusing on, okay, we need this finite state machine. Can we actually go ahead and design it using flip-flops? Um, so it, it, it gets to a very, very exciting point in the course where you have very real world examples that you could design now uh, with flip-flops. And, you know, some parts of it are uh, straightforward, but some of some uh, steps in this design process uh, tend to be a little bit more difficult just because they 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 they, they have a lot of creativity uh, about they, they would need you to be creative about how you choose states and how you do the uh, state assignment so the basic design approach for a finite state machine design involves six steps even though it might look very uh, very long uh, later on you will see that a few initial steps are actually the ones that are critical. But after that, once you get to a, a symbolic state table, things are the usual, like things will move in a very systematic manner uh, and it will only be about time it takes uh, and nothing else. So, you know, going from uh, a, a statement of specification to a state uh, diagram is what is crucial. Once you get there, after that, it will be a, a pretty straightforward process. So today we are going to be talking about various types of FSMs. Um, so many examples coming your way. Uh, we'll start with a vending machine uh, example. Uh, this is uh, a machine that is supposed to deliver a package of gum after 15 cents is deposited single coin slot for dimes and nickels and it's not going to give you back any change so very similar to the fsm concept example that we saw but now we are putting in more uh, details into this uh, in that we are saying package of gum in that we are saying uh, uh, there is only a single slot uh, for dimes and nickels and of course no change back so you know, let's start with step number one. We start with trying to understand the problem and this might uh, involve drawing a picture. Now, in some cases, drawing a picture makes sense and in some other cases, it might not make sense uh, because either it's too trivial or it's too, too complicated, right? So, but in a case where you are able to draw a picture to get a better understanding of the FSM, uh, step one will be very helpful. So you have your inputs in terms of, uh, let's see, let me highlight that in blue. Nickel, dime, and reset to bring back the finite state machine into the starting state. We can call that the reset state. And then of course there is a clock input for the vending machine FSM because the FSM involves some logic gates as well as flip-flops. And all those flip-flops are edge trigger devices and hence they would need a clock input. So we to, for this vending machine, um, finite state machine, we have a coin sensor that is going to detect whether a nickel was uh, put into the slot or a dime was put into the slot. And depending on which coin was entered by the user, it is going to assert a signal N or D that goes as an input to the vending machine, finite state machine. And then the vending machine is going to keep track of how much money is currently being deposited. And then once it reaches the 15 cents value, it is going to assert or activate an output. So this is our output. Uh, let me do pink. That's our output. Um, 
it's going to assert the output, which is going to activate a gum releasing uh, mechanism. So that's, you know, a, a picture to show you what that this FSM is about. Okay, looks like So let's take a look at the second step. This is a uh, map into more suitable abstract representations. So what I have over here is almost a, a, a tree of possibilities, right? So uh, I'm going to first tabulate the typical input sequences, which means that you are, you are going through all the cases of how a user might enter those nickels and dimes to get that package of gum. So one possibility, of course, is to enter three nickels. The other possibility is a nickel followed by a dime. The other is dime followed by a nickel or two dimes or two nickels in a dime. So all these are input sequences that lead to a favorable outcome. And that outcome is open output becoming one. Now I have sketched a state diagram on the right, uh, I want you guys to, um, you know, try to uh, determine what type of finite state machine this is. Clearly, your options are more and your other option is melee. So in the chat box, if you guys can let me know what type of finite state machine this is by observing the FS, F, uh, state diagram. By observing the state diagram, can we find out, looks like a more, 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 yes. More is absolutely right. Um, and more is right because so the, the correct answer is more, of course. Uh, let's see. Because if you see the state, where is the state? S4, say. Where is the output? Output is f attached to the state. So output depends over here on the state in which the uh, finite state machine is in. So as soon as you see the output being inside the circle, you you know it's going to be a Moore machine. You don't have to look further because otherwise you would have seen something like this where it, it was, you know, part of the arc, which is, it, it's not. So that's why it is going to be a Moore machine. All right, um, let's come back. Suppose we start way at the top. You press a reset button um, you know, that's one of your inputs and you go to some state S0. From S0, there is a branching out like structure because every state will have two possibilities to move forward. The two possibilities, well, there are actually three possibilities. Um, the three possibilities being uh, the next input of nickel, the next input of dime and the next input of reset. Well, of course, from any place, when you hit reset, you go back to S0. That's what that arrow indicates. So we don't worry about that. We are going to more focus on N and D, right? So from every state, you see at least two arrows coming out representing what is the next state if you get a nickel. What is the next state if you get a dime? So, and you stop when your output is open, right? So for S0, S1, S2, S3, you are not releasing that uh, package of gum, but for seven, eight, four, five, six, those states, you are releasing that package. And those states, those five of them, let's see, what is S7 corresponding to? S7 is corresponding to get a nickel, get a nickel, get a nickel, right? So that is corresponding to getting three nickels 
input sequence and that's how you reach S7. And S8 is two nickels followed by a dime, right? So two nickels followed by a dime, that is your S8. So I hope now you see how tabulating that uh, typical e input sequences can help you with the state diagram sketch. Um, and then of course you can you can go on with this. You can say S4 is going to be the state we uh, achieve uh, by entering by by inserting nickel and a dime. So nickel and a dime, right? And of course there are five of them, and those five are over here. Let's actually finish this. Uh, S5. The way you reach S5 is dime and nickel. And then let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay. And S6 is going to be d dime and dime, two dimes, right? So all those input sequences that give you a favorable outcome are essentially mapped to the state diagram. And once you uh, get the output open, and that's where you essentially stop with this, because every time the assumption with the, st uh, with the vending machine FSM is after it releases the gum, you have to press reset to kind of start this vending process again. Your output is only one. Open. Open is one means gum mechanism has been activated. Open is zero means gum release mechanism is not activated. So coming back to this uh, state diagram, now I, I hope more and more things are clear. Uh, one thing you notice, S0 goes to S1 and S2, nickel and dime, S1, nickel and dime, S3, nickel and dime, S2, nickel and dime. And once you get open, there, there's no more branching out. So this is one possibility for a state diagram, but it's not a very good uh, way to sketch the state diagram because we are using more states than we need. If you think back to your earlier lecture, we did this in four states. We did this in four states and we called those four states zero cents, five cents, 10 cents, and 15 cents, and that's it. So I, I, why use nine states here, right? This is nine states, zero to eight. Why use nine states when you can do the same vending machine with four states? Clearly, the less number of states you have, the less flip-flops you will need. Less states implies less flip-flops. And you will see uh, in a little bit that if you if you need nine states you actually need uh, two three no you need four flip-flops to do this so because four flip-flops can give you a maximum of 16 states um, three will get you to eight so if you need nine you would need to use four flip-flops to do this but if you were using the pre earlier state diagram with four states, you would just need two flip-flops to do it. So that's called state minimization. So state minimizations can lead to uh, the finite state machine design itself being simple. So that, that's why I use the word creativity, right? So if you are a little bit more creative, then you can do this state minimization leading to a, a, a cheaper implementation. So let's take a look at that state minimization. Our uh, we are essentially reusing the states whenever possible. That's the core idea. <clears throat> uh, Charles says flip flops equals seal of log two of states. That is absolutely correct. So that's the formula. The number of flip flops equals the seal operation of log to the base two of the number of states. This uh, formula comes up later in the lecture as well, but yes, that is absolutely right. So, so coming back to state minimization, we are going to try to use re uh, reuse the states whenever possible, and we are able to reuse states for the simple reason that I can reach 10 cents by putting in two fives 
or simply 110. But what really matters for this vending exercise is how much money is deposited. So I'm going to use the amount of money deposited to determine what state the vending machine is in. So now we only have four of them, zero, five, 10, and 15. So if you do the reset, so reset remains as is, right? Like uh, when you press, when the user presses the reset button, you go to the state, like you can call that say S zero, um, and that state is zero cents. And then what, if you put a, from, from now on, they are going to be again, two arrows coming out, coming out of each state, each circle. So zero cents, nickel and dime. From five cents, nickel and nickel is here, dime is there. From 10 cents, nickel or dime leads to the same thing because we are keeping the change. And then once you reach the 15 cent state, you open. From anywhere, if you hit reset, you go back to S0. Um, now, once you do this minimized state diagram, that is it this is where if you reach here that's the goal try to reach here because once you reach this point where you have got a minimized state diagram after that things are going to be very systematic like one after the other things are going to appear that you have seen with starting from counter design a few week a few lectures ago what is that First, you would draw a, a, a table with the following um, columns. Present state, inputs, next state, output, or outputs. Those four columns are, you know, it, it applies for every FSM every counter design those those are going to be uh, you know that is the skeleton of your symbolic state table and you read it this way right if you are in this particular present state and you get a certain input case what will be your next state and what is going to be your output in that present state so remember Again, this is a Moore machine, so the outputs are dependent on the present state only, right? So uh, you, we have to uh, asso assign the output depending on the present state. Uh, let's see, why is there a don't care for one one? Shouldn't, so uh, that's a very interesting question. Why is there a one one over here? And there is a one one over there, what does that mean? That means that the user is, uh, inputting or entering both the I should say inserting inserting dime and nickel at the same time but we said that is not possible because we said there is only one slot for the coins so that is not possible so the designer doesn't care about that one one case it should just be only one coin at a time uh, so that's absolutely right you can only put in one coin because there is only one slot so that was part of our assumption. Let's keep going. Uh, so once you lay out the present state inputs, next state outputs, in case of inputs, how many do you have? You have dime and nickel, right? So two inputs here, which means that at every state, you will have four possibilities. No nickel, no dime. No dime, one nickel. One dime, no nickel, or both of them at the same time, right? So because you have two inputs, for each present state, you will have four combinations. Here, 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 and then the last one is don't cares because after that, you just make the output one and wait for a reset. You're not taking any more coins in. So, by looking at the state diagram, you would fill out this symbolic state table. So for example, if you are at zero, zero, if you don't give it any coin, you remain at zero, zero, which is essentially meaning a, a, a self loop, right? Which means I, I, I don't give it anything. 
don't give any coin and you stay there. So self loops are not being shown in the state diagram, but that's what that, that uh, statement means. And if you are at zero cents, your output is zero. If you are at five cents, your output is zero. You're, if you are at 10 cents, your output is zero. The only time your output open is asserted is when you are in the 15 cent state. And we already talked about the one one, only one slot. So all these guys are kind of um, taken out like XX there, 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 and there too. Next. From each present state, take a look at the state diagram. For each particular combination, enter the next state. Outputs, by the way, are functions of the present state. Uh, come on. Because Moore machine. So for the outputs, when you're in zero cents, you have, uh, you write, no open, don't open, don't open, only open there. So the only the only time it becomes a one is when you reach the 15 cents there, state. Uh, okay, so once you read the symbolic state table, what do we do? We go to the encoding of the states. So I can choose any arbitrary encoding. For example, I can say zero cents, I can map that as uh, zero, zero. Five cents, I can map that as zero, one. 10 cents, I can map that as one, zero. Uh, one, uh, 15 cents, I can map that as one, one. And what do I call the uh, states? Well, I call the states Qs, right? So I can use this as Q1 and Q0. Those are the outputs of the flip-flop. So the output of the flip-flops in your FSM, that is what denotes the state you are in. So if the two output, obviously you need two outputs because there are four states, Q1 and Q, Q1 and Q0. Q1 and Q0 indicate the present state. Q1 plus and Q0 plus would indicate the next state. And that depends on your, your input coming in. But that's my state assignment. And you know, right now it is an arbitrary assignment. You can choose a different one, but you will have to stick through it until the completion of your circuit. So that's the next step here to go to the state encoding, which will also lead us into answering how many flip-flops are needed. Of course, you have Q1 and Q0. And if you have Q1 and Q0, Obviously, you need uh, two flip-flops, right? Doesn't matter which flip-flops. Right now, I'm using D flip-flops. D1 and D0 indicate the input of your, uh, uh, indicate the next state of those t two D flip-flops. Uh, remember, Q plus equals D here. So instead of writing Q1 plus and Q0 plus, we are writing D1 and D0 for the next state columns. Um, and choosing D flip-flops might not be the best choice, but it is an easy choice uh, because the, the, the filling out of the table uh, becomes very easy. You don't have to uh, look at the excitation tables too much. Uh, you can quickly refer to the characteristic equation and fill out this table uh, if you are using a D flip-flop. But there's no rule that you cannot use other flip-flops. You can use, uh, since you have two flip-flops, you can actually use one JK, one D. You can use a combination of uh, the flip-flops as well. Just as we thought, uh, just as we discussed in uh, the counter design lecture. So all we did from the previous symbolic state table to now is encoded things. So zero cents became zero, zero, five cents, 10 cents, and 15 cents. And we re, uh, we uh, wrote down the remaining things as before. So if you are in the zero cent state and you get nothing, you stay in the zero cent state, zero, zero. And then if you are in the zero, zero state and you get a nickel, you go to uh, like five cents, right? So zero, one. 
output is zero here, 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 and then output is one only in the last column there. So I hope that at this point, uh, things are very straightforward and, and, and you guys are uh, uh, able to follow along pretty, pretty easily. Um, so uh, some important questions, how many flip-flops are needed? Um, for that, you would need to know how many states you have in your finite state machine. Uh, also, the fact that you are you can use any type of flip-flop for this, but using D flip-flop um, gives you the, the benefit of a, an easier uh, table filling exercise, right? Like that, that's the only that's the only advantage here. Um, so it might not be beneficial in terms of the number of gates. Num the cost it would have when you implement this finite state machine. That might not be uh, the best. Um, let's see. Questions about uh, step four? Are they, uh, I'm guessing this is uh, pretty straightforward, but if there are any questions, we can talk about them now. One thing to also note with a Moore machine is that the output changes because output is dependent on present state. That means that the output open is going to get active only after the finite state machine goes to the next state, right? The, the, the present state is the present state. Like it, it's not going to it's not a function of next state, it is a function of the present state. So it is going to wait for that edge of the clock, go to the present, become the present state of zero, one, uh, zero, five cents, 10 cents or 15 cents, and only then activate or uh, inactive open output. So it's after the clock edge uh, is what I'm trying to say things have to become present in order for it to become active. Okay. Now, what do we have? We have a very, very long, uh, easy exercise remaining to go to the uh, circuit, to go to the actual FSM. What is that? K maps, uh, combining things, and logic expressions, and then sketching things. How, how did we come up with 3K maps? Well, how many outputs did we have? We had open, right? We had open, so let me erase this and talk about. So clearly we have open as one output. We have D1 and D0 as the two other outputs. So essentially, we are trying to write equations for, actually, this doesn't look good at all. So let me just uh, write what we are doing here. Uh, write simplest SOP or POS, we, we, you know, simplest equations for D1, D0, and outputs, only one of them here open in terms of you have Q1, Q0, D, N, right? So you have got four inputs here. Two of them are the present state of the FSM and the other two are the coins being inserted. So that's that. But we are writing the equations for the outputs. D1 and D0 indicate what should be the input to those D flip-flops and open is the final output of the FSM. So this is actually like a, a long table, right? So you're going to have how many? Uh, four inputs essentially. So you have 16 rows. Uh, so it's a four variable K map, how many do we need? Three of them, right? So we are, we are gonna need three, uh, four 
more variable k maps. And that's exactly what we have over here. So there's no point doing this again. Uh, I hope at this point in the course, you guys are very, very comfortable with this, uh, how to combine the ones and the leave out the zeros and use the don't cares only when it helps you make a bigger group. So I, you know, at this point, I, I'm assuming that everybody is good with this particular slide. We are using D flip flops because it's the easiest to use as far as the design process is concerned. But eventually, when you actually implement it, it might actually cost you more than the use of other any other flip-flop. So you have done a K-map for D1, K-map for D0, K-map for open. All three four variable K-maps have been sketched out. You have combined things. And then you obviously will, uh, the, the final output of this will actually be the three equations that are indicated by this box here. An equation for D1, an equation for D0, an equation for open. All of them are going to depend on four things, Q1, Q0, D, and N. And we are going for the simplest SOP expressions, and that's what these are. And I hope you notice open being the output only depends on the present state. It is actually just Q1 and Q0. So how do you sketch that out? Well, take so let's, let's see how do you sketch open out. Open, which is your output, driving the gum release mechanism, is an AND operation between the outputs of the flip-flops, Q1 and Q0. So you take Q1 from the f top uh, flip-flop, you take Q0 from the bottom flip-flop, put them through an AND gate, and that's your open. And then similarly, you have D1. Let me use yellow for this. D1 is... Q1 or D or Q0 times N. So how do you sketch that? D1 is the input to the top D flip-flop. So you can call them, uh, say for example, you can call them flip-flop one and flip-flop zero, right? So the, the inputs and outputs of flip-flop one are D1 and Q1, inputs and outputs of flip-flop zero are D0 and Q0. So that, that will help you uh, with the naming. Now, how do you sketch D1? Q1 or D or Q0 and N. So that particular uh, highlighted in yellow is actually implemented over here. And similarly, you have the other one for D0 that's being implemented right here using a bunch of AND gates and an OR gate. And you know, you, you can uh, represent them in uh, using NAND gates uh, or you know other types of gates as well. But over here we are using simple uh, sum of products form. Another thing to note, both the flip-flops are responding to the negative edge of the clock that was not a part of the description, or not a part of the problem statement, but that was a choice the designer made. That whenever the clock goes from high to low, that's when you change the state. Uh, there's also an active low reset input if, if that can be used to bring the flip, uh, finite state machine back to the original, st original state of zero cents. Now, apart from the two D flip-flops, how many gates do we need? We need one, two, three, four. let me just write the numbers here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight logic gates apart from the 2D flip-flops. So let's see what would happen if we did the same vending machine FSM using JK flip-flops. Would we end up with a cheaper uh, implementation or how, how, what would it cost us? But this is it. This is your final step, step six, implementation using D flip-flops, or I should say implementation of the machine using flip-flops. Questions here?
All right, let's move on. So if we did the same thing using JK flip-flops, what do we end up with? Well, nothing really changes in terms of our state diagram. Uh, state diagram remains the same. Symbolic state table also remains the same. The only thing that changes is your encoded transition table. And the reason why only this changes is because now instead of having D1 and D0, we will have J1, K1 and J0, K0. Um, notice over here, there's another output here open, which is also not going to change. So we have not, doesn't change, right? doesn't change from earlier why why not well open only depends on q1 and q0 and we actually derived that open equals q1 and q0 it doesn't matter it doesn't depend on d and uh, it, so i don't need to worry about uh, things changing because we move to j1 k1 j0 k0 it's a more machine so i don't need to worry about that um, so, because open doesn't change, we have not even made it a part of this table here. Present state, exactly the same thing as before. Q1 and Q0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, indicating 0 cents, 5 cents, 10 cents, and 15 cents. Inputs, exactly the same as before. Four possibilities for each state. Next state, exactly the same. Q1 plus and Q0 plus. Next state is absolutely the, the same. But to get to the next state, you see, if I want to go from, and here is why we, you know, we need to do this extra step for JK and T, but we didn't need to do this for D flip-flop. Because for D flip-flop, Q1 plus equals D. So our D1 and Q1 plus columns were exactly the same. However, when you use J and K, JK flip-flop or T flip-flop, that is no longer the case. You will have to spend more time on this state encoded table in this case. So for example, how do you write J1 and K1? Well, take a look at uh, Q1 and Q1 plus. So let me highlight them with blue. Zero to zero, right? Q1 to Q1 plus. How can I go from zero to zero? Well, make J1 as zero and K1 as don't care. That's how you make that transition happen. Where do I look this up? You look this up into in the excitation table of the JK flip-flop. Similarly, for J0, K0, you would take a look at 0 to 0. Again, 0x. Next, you have, uh, let's see. There is a 0 there, there is a, there is a 0 there. Oh, sorry. There is a 0 there. So 0 to 0. Again, 0x. Next, 0 there, 1 there, 1x. And you would go down this table exactly in the same manner. Q1 goes to Q1 plus. What should I provide at the input of the JK flip-flop in terms of J1, K1? Q0 go to, goes to Q0 plus. What should I give in order for that transition to happen at the input of the J0, K0 flip-flop? So flip-flop 0. So use excitation tables of, I can just write it over here, uh, excitation tables. Of JK, uh, excitation table, no, no, there's only one excitation table of JK. Right, that's how you, that's what you use to figure this out. Now, I want you to, I want you guys to um, kind of do this exercise with me. The way we said over here that we need three, four variable K maps. Can you guys tell me how, what we, what we will, what we will need here? How many flip flops and uh, how many, um, well, actually let's do that. How many flip flops do you, do I need for this? number of flip-flops in this case jk flip-flops 
two is right. Number of flip flops doesn't change. Absolutely right. Next question is, uh, how many K maps? Number of K maps. Alejandro says, uh, three, four, which one? <laughs> you guys are counting now. <laughs> All right, five, I think our five is, is where I will uh, say is right. So four is also kind of right because you are, you are not including open because we already know Q1 and Q0. But if I included open, then one for J1, K1, J0, K0, open. So those are five K maps. Uh, what is the size of the K map? How many variable K maps are those? Size of each K map. Four variable is right. Because for each of them, you have Q1, Q0, D, and N. Those are the four variables. So you would write five equations for J1, K1, J0, K0, open in terms of four variables q0 q1 d and n so pretty pretty long exercise but nothing difficult it's just you know uh, going through the motions here so we have got one two three four variable k maps the fifth one of course is uh, not sketched because that's open each K map for J1, J0, K1, K0 is a four variable K map that depends on Q1, Q0, D and N. The simplest SOP expressions are derived and listed in this box and then sketched in the FSM over here. So you start off with two flip flops, two JK flip flops, and we are assuming that it's a negative edge trigger design. And then depending on the equations that you got, you make the connections. Here we need seven gates. So a little bit cheaper, right? Not, not, not much, but a little bit cheaper than the D flip-flop implementation. So this exercise was done to just show you that depending on which type of flip-flops you, uh, which type of implementation or type of flip-flop you choose, you may have a different cost at the end, which is why we need to go back to that statement counters have a very toggle uh, tog counters have a toggling feature in built into them so a t flip flop is the best choice for that uh, registers have a data uh, placeholders for data right so d flip flops suit that the best but in a generic vending machine there is no way to say which one is the best. You you actually have to do it uh, to, to figure that out. There's no uh, one right answer for a generic FSM. There is one right answer for counters, T flip-flop. There is one right answer for registers, which is D flip-flop, but there's no one right answer for FSMs. For that, you just have to go through it and then do the comparison. Okay, um, let's do another uh, a simple counter. This is a complex counter just because we are uh, switching the mode of the counter using an input M. So this is our input. It's a three bit counter with one input bit. It's called the mode bit, which is M. So if M is zero, the three bit counter is supposed to count the next binary number. So that means it's going to go zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, back to zero and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the usual sequence, three bit up counter when M is zero. However, this FSM, when the input is one, it should count the next gray code number. So it goes zero, one, three, two, six, seven, five, four. Notice the adjacent number is only differing by one bit and you, you but you are going through all the eight possibilities 
So you still go from 0 to 7. All of them are there in this counting sequence. But this is gray code because the next value will only differ by one bit. So for example, if you go from 0, 0, 0 to 0, 0, 1, only this bit changes. And then when you go to the next one, only this bit changes. And then when you go to the next one, only this bit changes and so on. Right. Um, so that's your gray code. Um, and that should happen when your input is one. So your counter is counting differently depending on how you choose that input M to be. So for this, we are not going to complete the entire exercise because we already have said that once you reach the state diagram, after that things are pretty straightforward. So we will just do the state diagram for this. So how many states do we need? Well, we need one state for each output combination. How many combinations do you have for the output? Well, the counter is supposed to count anywhere between 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1. So obviously we need eight states. Those eight states are indicated as S0 all the way down to S7. And the output of this counter is simply the outputs of the flip-flop. It's the, it's the uh, next state, right? So for a counter here, output is equal to the next state. Oh, sorry, output is the present state. Right, so if you are uh, in S0, you are your outputs of the three flip flops that you would need are 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 and so on, right? So eight states, three flip flops and your transitions or the arcs are sketched for the input mode bit M. So from each circle, from each state, there are two arrows coming out. One for M is zero, one for M is one. So if suppose you are in uh, state zero, S0 and you get a 0 or a 1 for both the binary counting and the gray code counting you go to state 1 0 0 1 but from state 1 if you see if you get a 0 that's binary counting you go to state 2 but if you get a 1 for the input if it if mode bit is 1 at that time you go to actually 0 1 1 state 3 that's counting in gray code and that's how you actually fill out the all the arcs for uh, this state diagram. And again, there is a reset to initialize things. Uh, and that's going to be kind of like a given for all the uh, for, for all the finite state machines. Reset to kink, kick things off. And then, you know, finally, when you reach state seven, one, 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 if you are counting normally using the binary counts, you come back to zero, zero, zero. However, from state seven, if you were counting in gray, you actually go to five because after seven here, it is five, right? You come back to zero, zero, zero after one, zero, zero. After four, you come back to zero, zero, zero. That's indicated by this. Right there. So there's a, there's a different response to, you know, when that uh, pattern repeats. Okay, so once you come up with the state diagram, you know, it's it's all present state inputs. I'm just gonna write it down over here. So present state inputs, in this case, only one input M, next state output, there's no output, right? Output is the present state. Four columns, fill in the details, map the, map the states to 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 and so on. And then you say zero, zero, zero. If the input is zero, the next state is zero, zero, one. If the input was one, it would be also zero, zero, one, right? So just fill out this, write um, the equations. How many equations would you need? In this case, you would need equations for uh, Q1 plus and Q, Q2 plus. Q1 plus, Q2 plus, sorry, Q2 plus, Q1 plus, and Q0 plus. Those are your outputs. Uh, you would need equations for those in terms of Q2, Q1, Q0, and M. So you would need three four-variable k-maps to do this completely.
but you know all of that is kind of um, redundant at this point. All right, so we are doing another state machine over here. Next example, this is a state machine design and synthesis. So we are actually, uh, you know, almost uh, coming to the finish here. So we are not implementing it. We are not pro giving the, the exact details, but we are talking about the complete design and synthesis process. So the example over here is design a combination lock with two inputs x1 and x2 and open the lock when the input sequence is x1 x2 x2 so you can you can think about this as like maybe pressing some switches to open a co combination lock um, so those inputs are x1 and x2 those are two possible inputs and if you do it in that particular sequence, x1 followed by x2 followed by x2, only then the lock should open and otherwise it should not open. And in this case, you are not sounding an alarm or anything. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty simple example. And to simplify things, we are going to assume that only one input per clock cycle is entered. So only x1 is entered in one clock cycle. We are not entering x1 and x2 quickly, right? So think about this, when when humans are going to be pressing switches, they are not going to press switches at the speed of the clock, right? So it's, it's pretty fair to assume that there is one input per clock cycle. And if the user doesn't enter a particular input in that clock cycle, we time out and we, you know, we stay where we, where we were. Or if we time out, we might choose to go back to the, the original state, right? Which is the starting state, which means that you didn't press anything yet. Let's take a look at this uh, design with trying to take a look at what are the states. Now, the, the, uh, I have found that the best strategy for this is to first talk about or think about the ideal way to open the lock. The best way, or I should say the only way to open the lock, things moving in the intended direction, what is that? It is, you start with some state A, that can be your reset state, right? So this is, you know, your, your starting state, or your reset state, we are calling that A. From A, if you want to move in the right direction, in the opening the lock direction, what should you get? Well, you should first get x1. And if you got x1, we are calling that new state B. What What's next? After x1, you should get x2. We are calling that state C. And after x2, you should get another x2. We are calling that state D. Right? So that is our kind of like, a, you can call that the good path, right? Meaning things are moving towards opening the uh, lock. Now, once you have uh, written the meaning and associated a name for that state, let's try, let's take a look at what the symbolic state table should look like. So for example, Let's see, I have the same, so all of this is the same as before, right? What? So all of that is the same as here. It's just the state assignment. What is the meaning and what is the name? That is the same as that. Now from each state, you have x1 and x2 as the two inputs. So this is how we are going to read this. Suppose you are in state A, right? You are start, you are starting out this uh, finite state machine. Somebody has pressed reset. You have come to state A. You are ready to start entering the buttons or hitting the buttons, right? 
So right now you try to imagine two buttons. One is X1 and the other is X2, right? And you have to enter X1, X2, X2 in order to open the lock. You cannot time out. This is time out, right? Why is this time out? Because you are not entering X1 and you are not entering X2 in the next in the current uh, cycle, clock cycle. So if you don't enter either input, you time out. And when you time out, you are staying, you, you continue to be in that uh, initial start state. So wherever you time out from, you stay, you go back or stay in the state A, which is you're not, not going anywhere. You have come back to, come back to uh, square one. That's your timeout state, right? Next. X1 is zero, right? So X1 is zero, but X2 is one. What does that mean? That means that the user has pressed X2 in the uh, state, in the state A. If you press X2 in state A, you are going nowhere because the first, first, um, correct button to press was x1 you press x2 so you remain in that start state you are no going again nowhere but if you were to press x1 and not press x2 then you move towards the good path state b is next however there is some ambiguity that is possible so for example if the user hits both buttons at the same time right so uh, that's the that's the danger user hitting both buttons at the same time now the designer may choose to do two things one is don't respond to it right so if the user hit button uh, user hits both buttons simultaneously no matter where you are go back to the reset state go back to the start state that's one way of uh, dealing with it. The other way of dealing with it is it is practically impossible to hit both buttons exactly at the same time. Meaning in reality one of them may count, right? Maybe this one gets counted or maybe this one gets counted, right? I don't know which one, but either one could get counted because it, in, in practice, it is absolutely impossible to hit it, hit both of them at the same time. If the clock is very fast, the, hu you, the user cannot be faster than a high speed clock. So one input might get counted. If one input gets counted, so for example, if this guy gets counted, one, zero, that's B, right? For this. If the other guy gets counted, which is one zero, uh, sorry, if I, I, I messed up here. If suppose this guy gets counted, then it is one zero, which is state B. If this guy gets counted, then it is zero one, then it is A. You see that? So depending on which one get, actually gets counted, you might accidentally move to B, you don't want that, right? Undesirable. You don't want to credit the user with moving ahead when they actually just cheated by pressing the buttons at the same time. That is undesirable. So uh, what uh, the designer might do is to force such kind of situation to just A. But there is an ambiguity that the designer has to deal with in that case of hitting both buttons at the same time. Um, if you are in state A, do you unlock? No, you don't unlock there. You only unlock when you actually go to state D, right? Let me ask again, what type of uh, finite state machine is this? Type of finite state machine
So your options, of course, are more and milli. And try to take a look at the output and what it depends on. The output here is unlock. What does it depend on? And answer more or melee. Anyone? At this point, I, I, I would assume that this is more is absolutely right. Because output 0001 is dependent on the state the machine is in a b c d so if you are in state d you unlock there output depends on the present state more machine all right so let's see let's go on with this so that's you do you unlock in state a no you don't unlock in state a next let's come down to state b state b means i got x1 Let me take a pause here and ask this, this question. Why are we not having a state called got x2? x2 self loops to the start you are right if you got x2 that actually means you you are nowhere you are in the start state a right so you you don't care about x2 because that's not your good path so you don't have that particular state you only have states that are useful that's why you don't have x2 here because there is no, you don't do anything for x2. You only respond to x1, x2, x2, right? That's the sequence that you are you are after. Let's come back. So suppose you got x1. You go to state B. That's state B. From state B, again, those are the four possibilities. Timeout, go to A. x2 gets counted. Then you go to C because that would mean that you got x1, then you got x2. So you that will be state C. If you are in x1, which is b, you got x1, then you got another x1, what does that mean? The previous x1 can be ignored. Now you can count, count that as the, the new x1, right? So if you get x1 and you press x1 again, you are going to start state A. Because you see x1 followed by x1, that is a incorrect uh, sequence you go back to the start if you try to hit both of them at the same time again that ambiguity exists so either a might get counted or c might get counted a getting counted is makes more sense if c gets counted that's undesirable because that means that the user is getting away with just hitting both buttons twice and actually moving up in the good path to state C. So that's undesirable again. You don't unlock here as well. Next state got x1, x2. So you've got x1, x2 now. You're almost there. That The, the name of the state is C. If you time out, you go back to A. If you got x1, x2, and then again another x2, you are in state D where things will open. That's good. If you go x1, x2, and then again x1, you go back to reset because you have entered the wrong sequence. Let me come back to th these two cases uh, in a little bit because there, there is another way of dealing with these guys. Let me come back to that. Um, next, if you hit 1, 1 again, you could either be in A, you could either be in B because of that ambiguity. Um, D is absolutely undesirable now because by hitting the both the buttons twice, the user actually got away with it. They were able to unlock it. So you absolutely, as a designer, don't want to allow that. Uh, a getting counted is more reasonable, which means you are going back to the start state. 
or perhaps an alarm sounding is even more uh, useful, you don't unlock in state C. State D is x1, x2, x2. From that particular state, if you time out, you go back to state A. If you press, uh, after you unlock, you press x2, again you press x2, that's A or D. That's again the uh, possibility that the previous x2 didn't get counted, right? So if the previous x2 didn't get counted because of that ambiguity, you, your x2 might get counted here. If you get x1 followed by x2 followed by x2, you are, o you are open now and then you get an x1, that should count as the new x1 here. So that's your state B. Hitting both of them uh, again together, then now there's no moving forward. You're already there in state D. So you reset here, unlock output becomes one in state D. So that's how you would fill up the two table. You have two inputs, x1 and x2, you have four states. Depending on that, you would, you would go through the process of figuring out next states and output unlock. Now, I wanted to come back to these two, right? These two mean that if you are in state B and you got x1, you so you got x1, you get another x1, you go to reset state. Now, because this is a combination lock, it is supposed to be more secure, so it's more, supposed to be more sensitive to an incorrect input sequence, which is why we are going to back to A, right? All the way back to reset. But I should point out that if this was some sort of a, a pattern recognizer, like like a, okay, you're trying to keep track of 101 sequence. In that particular case, if it was not so sensitive application, then if you, if you got X1 and you got another X1, you might want to stay back in state B because that, sh that new X1 should count as the got X1, right? So I, I'm not sure if uh, this is clear, but the designer could have actually chosen B for this. And over here, got X1, got X2, then I got X1, B here as well, right? So they could have chosen B here if the application was not sensitive uh, as a, a lock, combination lock. So for example, for a, a string recognizer, you might choose to, to, to go to B instead of uh, staying at A. So your, your choice of how you do the state transition uh, matters uh, so, or is uh, a direct consequence of the application that you are designing it for. Obviously locks are supposed to be uh, more sensitive than a string recognizer. All right, questions about this example? Unlock represents an output that will make the combinational lock open. So it's a, it's a mechanism to, so think about a, you know, that's your box and there are switches X1 and X2 written on it. And this box will open when you press this guy and then this guy and then this guy again, right? So to open that, you need some signal, right? Some signal to, to become active in order for that to open. Like we had the gum release mechanism uh, in the previous example. It's something similar to that. Okay. Let's uh, move on here. We have talked about these things. State assignment. Uh, we can uh, m minimize the number of states. We already talked about how many uh, flip-flops we need. Uh, let's see. State, uh, okay, I, 
I don't think we need to talk about anything over here. We have kind of gone through these guys in detail. All right, so the next step in this combinational lock is to do the state encoding. So the state encoding we have chosen is state A. So here, let me write the state name here. Name was A, B, C, and D from before. So we chose A as 0, 0, B as 0, 1, C as 1, 0, and D as 1, 1. Obviously, four states. So two flip-flops. If there are two flip-flops, I should call the present state as Q1 and Q2 or Q1 and Q0, however you want to call it. Then, depending on 0, 0, you have, this is uh, what, what this is, uh, Q1, Q2, right? So this is Q1 plus and Q2 plus. Same thing, Q1 plus and Q2 plus. And same thing, Q1 plus and Q2 plus. Q1 plus and Q2 plus. So essentially, um, the previous uh, state encoded table was vertical. This is some columns of, of this guy are, you know, transitioned to uh, horizontally. So that's why you have multiple next state columns for input sequences. So these are your inputs here. Where are you? So still you have, you know, all the, all the uh, information. Present state is right here. Inputs are there, and then let's see. Um, here are your next states. And then of course you have the outputs right here. So still the same four things, present state inputs, next state output, but they are arranged uh, slightly differently over here. Just because that this kind of arrangement makes more sense for this combinational lock exercise. Notice over here, eventually, what did we choose for one one, the ambiguity state? We chose to go for zero zero here, as you can see. We had to pick one, right? We had to pick one with a comma b a or c a or d we picked a because b c d would mean uh, giving the user uh, an advantage for uh, hitting both buttons twice uh, at the same time so we picked one and we went with that zero 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 uh, zeros here zeros here zeros here so state a essentially all right so from here what do you have uh, so let's do that exercise again. Uh, how many uh, K-maps are you going to have? States, obviously, states are two, 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 uh, four states. So you have two flip-flops. So number of flip-flops equals two. So that's given. Uh, what did we do next? We said uh, number of e equations or number of K-maps. Okay, number of K-maps. How many K-maps are you going to have to do this? Uh, assume, uh, let's see, which one should I pick? D flip-flops. Assume the implementation is using D flip-flops. In that case, how many K-maps would you need? How many K-maps would you need? And what is the size of each K-map? Guys, how many K-maps would you need if the implementation is using D flip-flops? Uh, 
Um, so, wh why do you think it's four, uh, Alan? Uh, feel free to use the mic if you if you want to, or type it in the chat box, whichever in, uh, is more convenient for you. Or maybe five. Should you should use two? Uh, so you guys are hitting all around the answer. So you have you have, you have done two, you have done four, you have done five. The number that you have missed is actually the the answer. All right. So they are going. You are going to need uh, three. No, <laughs> you are going to need three because you have one equation for uh, d one. Right, we, we have two flip-flops, so we need to figure out the inputs to those flip-flops. So you have an equation for D1, which is essentially Q1 plus, and you need another equation for D2 for Q2 plus, right? So Q1 plus and Q2 plus, if, you, if I use D flip-flops, Q plus equals D, so you have D1 and D2. So those are two of them, and then of course you have unlock as your third uh, uh, thing that you need to write. So D1, D2, unlock. So your number of K maps are going to be three. For D1, one for D2, one for unlock. How, what is the size of each K map now? So D1, for example, D1 depends on what? D1 will depend on Q1, Q2, x1 x2 right so size of each k map let me highlight the the inputs here each k map will depend on q1 q2 x1 x2 so size of each k map is 4 right so you are, you will need three four variable k maps to do this an equation for d1 an equation for d2 an equation for unlock one here one here and one here so once you have those three equations then you can start sketching things out and it should look something like this right so all the things are over here mentioned we got two flip-flops we got unlock uh, the the combinational logic is left for you because you know you, you the the k maps can be done um, but the inputs to that or you know this is d1 right this is D1 and this is D2. So D1 depends on Q1, Q2, X1, X2. D2 also depends on those four things. But unlock depends only on Q1 and Q2. It only depends on the present state uh, because it's a Moore machine and also how the K maps uh, turn out. Um, but but that process, this, this combinational logic uh, is not provided over here because that is the result of the minimization of all these uh, three K maps, right? So that, that is left uh, for you. But that's your final design, two flip-flops. So, you know, one, um, one technique that I would um, give you uh, is this, my suggestion for how to draw after you got the equations, right? Let me let me change this to this. So suppose you got equations, right? So you did the K maps, and you got the equations for D one, D two, and unlock. So if you if you are already there, if you have reached here, what how how do you sketch it out? The way I like to start is first I draw the flip flops. So right away I know that there are two D flip flops, one and two, right? Because there is a D one, there is a D two. So I've chosen D flip flops and I have two of them. So I'm going to draw two of them. Then I pick either a positive edge triggered or a negative edge triggered design based on uh, you know, uh, my choice. But I have to make sure that both of the flip-flops are the same edge, right? Either both of them are positive or both of them are negative. 
then I associate a name with them. So for example, for D1, I will call this flip-flop one. For D2, I will call this flip-flop two, right? Um, and then I have D here, I have Q there, I have Q there as well. And then I have D here, I have Q here, I have Q there as well. Right? So that's my first step. My next step is to highlight the inputs. My inputs are what? X1 and X2. My next step is to sketch the clock. And I connect that to both here as well as here. Next, I look at the equations for D1, D2 and unlock. Also, my unlock is somewhere here, right? Then depending on the equation for unlock, I will sketch some combinational logic here. And if it's a Moore machine, for example, then it will only depend on uh, the cues. So I will, I will, you know, go in here and then I'll go in here or depending on however, you know, I might be using the, the complement forms of the output. You know, it depends on how the equation turns out but then that will drive my unlock output. Similarly, for the equations for D1 and D, D2, this guy is my D1 input, and this guy is my D2 input, right? So D1 is related to some Qs. Where are the Qs? This is Q1, this is Q2, right? So I will take the Qs from here, X1 and X2 from here, and then that will be my combinational logic that will go in here as well as So that, that, that's essentially how I would work out, right? Like the whole design. So this is still left as a question mark because that depends on the equations. But I hope with this, you see how to build the circuit up, put the flip flops down, uh, put the clock down, uh, mark the input and output. Then you start sketching the combinational parts. This is your combinational logic. You know, in our block diagram, initially in, in, in our uh, lecture, we call this combinational logic F. And then we call this combinational logic G, I think. So in the finite state machine lecture, um, there were a couple of block diagrams. Uh, uh, I think it's somewhere here. Uh, yeah, see that? Combinational logic F and combinational logic G. Those are those are the ones that we just, just now sketched right there, F and G. All right, questions here? It's, uh, it's funny that the, the answer was three here, but you guys said every number but three. <laughs> you did one, two, four, five. All right, let's move on here. Um, as far as timing is concerned, we still have the setup and hold time considerations, right? We cannot uh, change the input uh, with respect to the clocking input too fast. So we have to hold the input uh, stable before the clock edge and after the clock edge for a small duration of time. Those are called setup time before the clock edge and hold time after the clock edge. These are minimum time requirements that need to be obeyed. Uh, if, we, if we don't obey that, obviously we end up in a metastable condition for our uh, finite state machine. Also, the propagation delay through a, a flip-flop is uh, is something that we need to consider uh, because outputs only become, uh, the next state is entered after the propagation delay from the the, uh, the present state going into the flip-flops and you have the active clock edge and then you get your next state is entered and the output becomes stable. So there is a propagation delay through the flip-flops that, need that needs to be uh, taken into account. 
Okay, let's uh, let's actually do something different here. Uh, let me go to a different problem and I'll come back to this. Let's do this. Uh, let's do a finite string recognizer. So what we have over here is an input X, only one input X. That's your say bit stream coming in. So this is like the two consecutive zeros, or I think we did two consecutive ones. Uh, we tried to detect two consecutive ones in the previous uh, lecture. This is something similar to that. So finite string recognizer, your input is X. So that's a continuous bit stream that's coming in, zeros and ones, bunch of zeros and ones. And you have one output Z, right? And this string recognizer or a pattern recognizer is supposed to do this particular thing. Z, the output should be one if the three previous input bits are either zero one zero or one zero zero. So if you get the three previous bits to be zero one zero, the output should become one in the next cycle. Or, or if the three previous bits were one zero zero, the output should become a one again. A few state assumptions that we need to make. Reset starts the finite state machine at the initial state, the start state or the reset state. And then Z is asserted when the following bit is seen. And we are also using a more machine implementation to do this. So let's take a look at the behavior of this uh, machine. So suppose you get a zero initially. Well, if you get a zero initially, the output only changes after the propagation delay, right? So there is a slight delay between the input and the output. So if you get a zero, your output is zero, right? So this maps to, oh, sorry, this maps to this. Zero is zero. Another zero, still zero. One, zero, zero, one. Well, we are not detecting that, so output is zero. But after you get the, Next, the fourth bit as zero, the last three bits were zero, one, zero. So that makes the output one. And then after that, again, you get a one there. What, what happens? The last three bits are one, zero, one. Are we detecting one, zero, one? No, we are not detecting one, zero, one. So your output is zero. The next bit, zero, one, zero. Last three bits are one. Your output becomes a one. So. Let me highlight why these are one, right? So this is a one because that is a zero one zero. And then this is a one because that is a zero one zero. And then this is also a one because that is a zero one zero. Uh, let's see. Uh, right. Let's uh, now no notice this. Z is zero, even though the three previous bits are zero one zero because one zero zero was seen earlier. You see this one zero zero was seen earlier right here. And if one zero zero was seen earlier, the new, uh, uh hold on, wait a second. Oh, I, I read this wrong. So, the, the, the finite state machine is supposed to enter one if the three previous bits are zero, one, zero, and one, zero, zero has never been seen. I actually read this problem wrong. All right, let me clarify. So it is supposed to detect both strings, but it is supposed to respond to do these strings a little bit differently. So for zero, one, zero, it should make the output one, which it did three times here, here, and here for yellow, like green, blue, and yellow. But the next part of the statement is 
if you detect 100 then your output will become zero after that it will you 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 stop recognizing 010 so because you had this 100 sequence here after that even if you get a sequence like this 010 you ignore that you keep the output at zero there so essentially there is a good path and there is a bad path over here but both of them need to be detected right so that that's that's what we are doing here so for this let us try to sketch out uh, the the state diagram ourselves so the way i do it i draw circles first so first i'm going to sketch out one circle for the reset state come on that's my reset state and then uh, let me call this say s0 and when the when I'm in this state, because I'm doing a Moore machine, my output is zero, right? I, I have not recognized anything. And I come here if I press reset. So that's my initial state. Then from here, I can either get a zero or I can get a one. If I get a zero here, I'm moving in the direction of 0, 1, 0, right? So I'm going to lay out these circles here to indicate the good path. So from here, I'm going to move here, move here, and move here. This is my good path. And I'm going to call this, say, S1 and S2 and S3, right? that S1 and S2 and S3 are, you can, you can we can read it like this. Uh, let me use maybe blue for this. If I get a zero here, I move to S1, right? So that's S1 is my got zero state. Then S2, so zero, one, and zero, right? That's the string I'm trying to recognize. So this is got zero, one state, and this is my got zero, one, zero state, right? And at S1, I have my output as zero. At S2, I have my output as zero. At S3, that's my output that I recognize as one, right? So that's my good path. I reset. I got zero, I got zero, one again, sorry, I got zero, then I move to zero, one, I move to zero, one, zero, and I make the output one, right? That's the good path. Now, because I need to monitor another string, one, zero, zero, I, and I need to do that because I need to respond to that as well. Differently, but I still need to recognize that. So I'm going to, lay out another path like this right here but I'm going to change these names and the inputs are going to change as well the numbers are going to change as well uh, and in fact the output over here will never be zero uh, and then the names as well are different so from S0 I could have gotten a one, which will take me there. And I am going to need to track one zero zero. So I have got, got, this is got one and then got one zero and this is got one zero zero, right? So that's zero here, that, that's zero here. So I hope now you see that we are trying to, tr and let's number them dif differently. Zero, one, two, three, and then let's have four, five, six on the other side. So four, five, six, right? So now I have 
the left path as the good path detecting 0, 1, 0 and the right path detecting 1, 0, 1, uh, 1, 0, 0. Right. So both strings are being recognized uh, as they are part of my uh, state diagram. But I still need to fill, fill things up. Meaning, from each state, there are two possibilities. The new input coming in can be a 0, can be a 1. <clears throat> so for, for S0, I have both of them covered, so I'm fine there. However, from S1, if I get a 1, I move to S2. But if I get a 0, where should I go? From S1, I got 0 here. If I get another 0, where should I go? back to S, well, if you get a zero, right? If you get a zero, what does that mean? That means you got S zero, zero, right? But this, you see, you, you cannot ignore that, right? You cannot ignore the new zero because that could be the start of a zero, one, zero sequence, right? So you cannot ignore the new zero that you got. So if you are in S1 and you got another zero, you have to treat it as the first zero that you got. So you, you, you need to stay there, stay at S1 then. Uh, let me draw it the other side. Uh, self loop with one, sorry, uh, zero. You see that? You, you guys see why we need to self loop back to zero? Because the new zero coming in could be the start of the new sequence, zero, one, zero. So we need to, we cannot ignore that and go back to reset state because we, otherwise we lose that first zero that you just got. So you need to stay at S1 for that. So from S0, both of them are covered. From S1, both of them are covered. Now let's take a look at S2. If you get a 0 from S2, you go to S3. Good. But if you go, if you are at S2 and you get a 1, where should you go? 0, 1, a new 1. If you get another one, where should you go? Zero, one. S4 is absolutely right because that could be the start of the one, zero, zero sequence. That could be the start of the one, zero, sequ zero sequence. So let me draw this. S2, if you get a one, oh, come on, you actually go to S4. Next, uh, S2 covered both of them. Now let's talk about S3. If you are in S3, you get a zero, where should you go? And if you get a, a one, where should you go? Let's do, uh, let's do uh, zero. If you get a zero here, where should you go? If you, at S3, if you get a zero, where should you go? Zero, one, zero, zero. You see, zero, one, zero, a new zero will make the last three bits one, zero, zero. Where should it go? To permanent off, yeah, then that is our S6, right? to permanent zero until reset. Yes, so that's our uh, S6. So if you get one zero and then another zero here, you go to S6. Now, zero, one, zero, uh, one comes in, where should you go? 
from here a one comes in where should you go you see your you, you have to keep track of the last three bits zero one zero one it could be in the got zero one state right so it should go back to s2 in that case you guys see that so from if you are in s3 you have got zero one zero and if you get a one that means that you got the look at the last three bits Z zero one right you, you you are in the got zero one state with with s2 now let's do this i think we are done with all the arrows on the left side let's go to the s4 state from s4 what does s4 mean s4 means got a, uh, got one if you get a zero you go to s5 what if you get a one if you keep getting a one that should count as the first one so you will you should stay there it is the same kind of uh, thing that happened on the left side for with s s1 and a zero now if you got one and then you got a zero that means you go to s5 if you are in s5 you know what to do with zero but what do you do with with a one so what happens when you get a one that means uh, let's draw it here if you are in s5 you got 1 and 0 and you're waiting for a new bit question mark and that bit is a 1 that means what the last two bits are again 0 1 so you move to s2 that's got 0 1 next uh, s4 is done s5 is done s6 from s6 what do i need to do from s6 s6 is i have detected 100 now clearly no matter what i get i should stay there until somebody hits return uh, uh, reset so if you get a zero or you get a one from there you have to stay there all right so that completes our state diagram for the finite string recognizer uh, it recognizes 010 zero, zero, but if it gets 100 zero, zero, then the output will never become uh, a one Now, once you have the state diagram, you can do the flip-flops. Obviously, we have seven states, so we would need at least three flip-flops to do this. Um, so let, let's actually do that exercise. Add, add a template here. How would the state uh, encoded table look like for this? You would have uh, present state inputs, in this case, just one, uh, next state output. What are my present states? Obviously, if I have seven states, I need three flip flops. If I have three flip flops, then I need to call the present states as maybe Q2, Q1, Q0. My input, only one, x. My next state, q2 plus and q1 plus and q0 plus. And actually I can call them, if I were using d flip flops to do this, I can call them d2, d1, d0. Output, only one, z. And then you would essentially fill this out. How many um, how many K maps are you going to get? Number of K maps. 
equals size of k maps equals number of k maps 4 is right let's highlight those 1 2 3 4 4 k maps 1 for d d2 d1 d0 and z uh, <laughs> what is the size of the k map with a 3 bit uh, yeah uh, if 4 yes 4 is right for this uh, let me do 4 here and then with pink this is 4 because you have got those four yes um so charles you are you are on the right track uh, you, uh, finite state machines will have many many implementations uh there is no no one right answer uh because the assumptions can change your num types of flip-flops can change your components that you choose to implement your finite state machine can change so uh, you know you can have a more elegant solution like the one that you chose like a three bit shift register uh, and monitoring the, the the bits but this is a process that can be applied to recognize any string pattern which is why i went through this uh, but you're, you're you're also right to point out that an alternate uh, or many alternate uh, finite state machine designs are possible. Um, you know, uh, clearly, you know, there's a state minimization at play. So doing things in using less states is preferable than more states. Um, you know, what type, type of flip-flop you choose? You know, are you covering for hazards or are you not covering for hazards? That is dependent on whether you choose to include the redundant prime implicants in your K maps or leave them out. So, uh, th th bottom line is there are many correct uh, possible answers. One such uh, method has been laid out over here, which can be applied to more generic, finite de uh, string string de detections uh, that you might come across. All right, so state encoded table, we have, we have gone about that. Let's go on. And then the, the, the next few slides are actually just going through the exercise that we uh, talked about. Uh, let's see, how are we doing with respect to time? We have about uh, 20 minutes left. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to slightly jump to a more interesting problem here. Right here. So this is another combinational lock example where you have two debounced push buttons X and Y and you are um, th th these are these buttons X and Y are being used to enter a combination. And if you enter the combination X, X, Y, X, X, then you open the lock. So this is kind of the like the previous example where you had x1 x2 x2 but now this is a little bit more realistic combinational lock with a, a longer input se sequence required to open the lock the sequence is it has to be x x y x x if and only if you get x x y x x you open the lock but there are also some other uh, features built into this combinational lock so for example if you press y three times in a row you reset the lock to the initial state. So if, if you are anywhere in the uh, state diagram, you press Y three times, you reset the lock. Now, the feature number three here is, anytime X is pressed out of sequence, what does pressing X out of sequence mean? Meaning X, X, then followed by another X, that is pressing X out of sequence, right? So if you press X out of sequence, an output signal sets out sets off an alarm to indicate that the lock is being tampered with something very realistic right so you cannot press x out of sequence if you do then you need to set off an alarm output 
Fourth feature, when the lock is open, pressing either X or Y will cause the lock to close without signaling an error. So without sig no error, if the lock is open, if you press any one of those push buttons, it will, the, the, the lock will close. Assumptions, any assumptions you, uh, you make need to be stated. So what does each state represent? What, what input conditions are causing uh, the state change and the output change? So all of these things uh, need to be stated very clearly before you jump into the state diagram. So let's start with the good sequence, the good path. What is the good path? X, X, Y, X, X, right? So let's focus on sketching that first feature in our state diagram. The state diagram over here might look very overwhelming, but if we go and break this down into smaller steps, this is not that bad at all. So where do we start? We start with S0. You press a reset button, you come to S0, right? After that, we are going to track the good path. The good path is got x, got another x, got y, got x, got x. So the one that is highlighted in yellow, you can clearly see, uh, by the way, is this a Mealy machine or a Moore machine? Mealy or Moore? Mealy is right. Mealy is right because you see output is on the arc. It is not on the state. And the outputs are actually two of them. One is for uh, alarm and one is for unlock. So it is zero, zero, zero. So zero, zero means no alarm, don't unlock. One zero, like here, it means sound an alarm, but don't unlock. So S0, S1, S2, S3, S4, S5, those are the five states indicating the good path, right? So from S0, you move to got X, got X, X, got X, X, Y, got X, 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 Y, X, got X, X, Y, X, X, S5. And as at S5, no matter what input you get, you go back to reset state. Now, where are things, uh, where are things unlocked? Things are unlocked only in this box, S5. That's the only time things are unlocked without an alarm, hence the color choice of green. So, outputs are 0, 0 here, no alarm, no unlock, no alarm, no unlock, uh, sorry, I should say no alarm, don't unlock, no alarm, don't unlock, no and no. No and no. But over here, you don't have an alarm when you are moving from S4 to S5. As soon as you get your new input, the fifth button press of X, as soon as that happens, while you are transitioning to this state, you unlock, but you don't sound an alarm, right? So it becomes unlocked on the transition. That's why melee, right? It, it can change. The output can change as soon as there is a change in the input. The change in the input is the fifth input bit press, X. So that's the good path that we have highlighted over here. Now let's go back and take a look at uh, the next feature. The next feature is press Y three times in a row to reset. How are we, how are we doing that? If you are in S0, you can press Y, Y again, and Y again. You go back to reset. That's how you are, uh, and while you are doing that, no alarm, don't unlock. So both the outputs are zero, zero here. So you are keeping track of those three presses in Y in that blue box here. One Y, two Ys, and three Y, the third Y, takes you to S0, the reset state. 
but you could also go to that reset state from any other state. So how are we doing that? Well, from S1, if you press the first Y, uh, right here, if you press the first Y, you come here. Don't alarm, no alarm, don't unlock. From S2, if you press a Y, you go to S3, right? But from S3, you can press Y's again. So if you press the second Y here, you actually go to S7. So you, you end up here because that will be the second Y. Then S4, if you press a Y from S4, that should go to S6 because that is the, just the first Y there. From S5, then, you know, that is going back to reset state no matter what you press. So we don't, we don't have that arrow. So all the blue arrows over here indicate the, the, the things getting reset. There may be other arrows as well. So let me try to take a look here. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, reset. Why, why, why? Right. So this is also reset. So suppose you are in S8. S8, S9 and S10 belong to the alarm group, alarm state. That means that you have pressed X out of sequence. But if you have pressed X out of sequence, there is still a way for you to reset the machine by doing the three Y's. So first Y, second Y, third Y goes through S0. So all those highlighted in blue are feature number two. Right. Now let's go to uh, the, the, the third feature here, which is, uh, let's do it in uh, red, pink. Uh, Any time X is pressed out of sequence, the output sets off an alarm to indicate the lock being tampered with. Uh oh, all right. When is, when is that going to happen? Well, that could happen from S2. Why is that? Because you wanted, you wanted X, X, Y, but if you pressed X, X, the third X, you go to the alarm state, S8. Which is where you sound an alarm, which is why you have that output to be one, but you don't unlock here. So you never unlock in this red box. You are always sounding an alarm in the red box. But there are ways to come out of that red box by hitting Y three times. Uh, how else could you go into that alarm state? Well, if you, if you press Y once and you press Y twice, you are in S7. But if you press X at that time, that is pressing X out of sequence. You go back to that alarm state S8. There are other ways to end up in this state as well. If you are in S8, which means you are sounding an alarm, and if you wanted to reset this, you would need to press Y three times. But what if you press Y once, and then press X out of out of turn, out of a sequence. You go back to S8. So that is also kind of the, the pink path there. You could also accidentally press two Y's and then press out of sequence, which, which means you again go back to S8 there as well. And you could be in S8 and you could panic and press X multiple times which, which means you continue to be in that alarm state. So that is also pink, right? Which indicates that you are uh, in the alarm state. So there, are, there, there is only one way for you to walk back the alarm, which is pressing Y three times. And hopefully only the, the person who, is, uh, who knows that sequence of pressing three Ys is able to reset the lock, uh, reset the alarm, right? Where are things unlocked? The only place where things are unlocked is here. So only when you are going from S4 to S5, that's the only time you unlock. Everywhere else, your unlock is uh, unlock output is zero. Where do you sound an alarm? 
if you are going to F8, you're, you're sounding an alarm. That is pressing, uh, that, that is pressing, uh, so S6 should also have a pink pad. Where is that? Where is S6? Da, 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 da. Oh, yeah, you're right. You are right. So S6 is press Y once and then pressed X uh, in the in the wrong sequence. That is also an alarm. Yeah, you're right. So alarm sounds there. That is your reset box. That's your unlock box. All right. So how can we simplify this? We can simplify this by first looking at the yellow cycle, right? Got X, the intended way to unlock things. After that, you try to expand to all the possibilities, right? So if you did X, X, Y, X, X, then you start talking about, all right, if it was not X, if it was Y, what would happen? If it was not X, if it was Y, what would happen? And so on so you would branch out after you sketch the intended path so this is a, a, a very comprehensive finite state machine a milli machine that uh, shows you how to deal with uh, a, a very realistic um, combinational lock with a longer input sequence an alarm feature uh, and unlock as well all right Let's see, is this appearing on the screen? Hmm. What happened to it? Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are able to see any changes in the screen. Well, I, I think, okay, now it, it started kicking in. <laughs> maybe now anyway um, so I hope that uh, this discussion was uh, you know helpful to you in order to um, uh, navigate the finite state machine design process there are a few more examples that are on the slides but I hope that with the discussion that we have had uh, you guys are um, you know equipped to uh, look at those other finite state machine designs that are available there is a simple traffic light controller which uh, talks about you know expiring uh, uh, expiration of some timers uh, so take a look at that uh, uh, please ask me questions if you have any in fact I can I, I will try to make a uh, another video of of that uh, asynchronously and uh, provide it to you so that you can watch it uh, questions at this time so what I'm trying to say is there are a, a couple of examples of finite state machine design here that we have skipped over which are essentially simpler than what we have discussed at the end uh, I, I will provide that information as a as a asynchronous uh, a video so I'll upload that uh, sometime later okay um, so let us stop with this I'm gonna stop recording here